let's do just that. We had talked briefly last week about Jeremiah and Lamentations. Tonight, uh, as we try to sort of begin to commence to start to endeavor to catch up a little bit, we are in Ezekiel and Daniel, uh, at least for the first part of the class. So take your Bible, turn to Ezekiel. You might want to take a look at the textbook also. You may have some notes in your email from uh, Brother Dave that I sent him on Ezekiel and Daniel. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, notes on Chronicles or some of the other prophets that we'll be looking at tonight that I can pass along. But uh, these you might find to be something helpful as time goes by. Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, Jeremiah. Jim Gentry says, I'll be in Denver next Tuesday night. Okay, that's fine, Jim. Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, several others of the prophets were all contemporaries in the same time frame, the same general uh, roughly 50-year period before, during, and after the conquest and captivity of the children of Judah. Jeremiah that we looked at last week was in and around Jerusalem, right at the scene of all of the action. Uh, Daniel that we'll look at uh, here in a little bit was in the palace in Shushan and in Babylon and various other places wherever the royal personages were. He was a Babylonian bureaucrat. Ezekiel was in between the two. Ezekiel was by the Grand Canal or the River Kibar, as it's described in our biblical text. This was a man-made or at least partially man-made canal uh, that connected two points on the River Euphrates, about 60 miles long, really an astonishing uh, engineering feat for that era. But it was the area used uh, as kind of the breadbasket of the Persian Empire, the Babylonian Medo Empire. It was an area that was the, the canal was used to irrigate that area uh, so that they could produce grain. Now, Ezekiel was, as I said, sort of in between Jeremiah and Daniel. Daniel is at the highest echelons of uh, politics and government. Uh, Jeremiah, at the, on the other end, once Josiah, the, the righteous king, dies, Jeremiah is persona non grata. He is unwelcome in the palace in Jerusalem, except as a prisoner on more than one occasion. His message is rejected. Uh, Ezekiel is of basically the middle class. Now, Ezekiel is a priest. His father's name is, is Buzi. He was high enough in the priestly classes and in the middle class that in 597, nine years after Nebuchadnezzar first put Jerusalem and Judah to tribute, he came back, deposed the king, replaced him, took Jehoiachin into captivity, and took about 10,000 of what we would call the upper middle class, the, the lower class nobles, the priestly class, the, the skilled trades class, and so forth, about 10,000 captives roughly into uh, Babylon. And these were settled not as prisoners, not as slaves by any stretch, but basically as forced colonists, you might say, along the Grand Canal in the, in the alluvial plains, the the fertile plains along between the Tigris River and the uh, canal there uh, to work and to live uh, in a sense as insurance of the good behavior of Zedekiah, but ultimately as citizens of the Babylonian Empire. They were, the effort was to assimilate them into the empire just as uh, Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had been educated to be assimilated into the empire. Now, unlike those four faithful men that we'll talk about in a little while, the majority of this group of roughly 10,000 settlers, you might call them, 
we're not focused on being particularly faithful to God. The whole reason that Judah is oppressed and ultimately conquered and brought into exile by the Babylonians was what? They had been unfaithful to God. They had been unfaithful to God going all the way back, really all the way back to Egypt, all the way back to the Exodus at various times. But especially after the fall of Israel, the northern kingdom, especially in the 125 to 150 years leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, in spite of the presence of men like Josiah, the nation as a whole, the attitude of the nation as a whole, the attitude of the leadership in Judah as a whole, had focused on unrighteousness, idolatry, ungodliness, selfishness, self-centeredness, abuse, misuse of their own people. They had become everything that they had watched Israel become, and then some. They really, they, they, they followed Israel's example and then tried to outdo Israel in many respects. And so in 597, God allows Nebuchadnezzar to come back in, depose the king, and cart away roughly 10,000 Jews. These are settled, and the effort is made to assimilate them into the empire. Now, th there is a logical, uh, th there's a logical purpose to that. By taking away this group of, consider them influential citizens in Judah, uh, movers and shakers, business people, trades people, upper echelon uh, priests and, and local bureaucrats and so forth. And the majority of them seem to have come from in and around Jerusalem in the immediate area. By taking them out, <coughs> number one, Nebuchadnezzar uh, militarily and economically cripples Judah to a large degree. He's going to force Judah to be far more, Zedekiah the king is, is going to be far more dependent on Nebuchadnezzar's good graces than uh, Jehoiachin ever had been. And so he, he's really, by taking these people out of Jewish society, he leaves the nation largely at his mercy. But also, these are the upper end of the educated classes, the skilled people and so forth. And if he can get these people to assimilate into Babylonian culture, if they will adopt Babylonian culture and Babylonian customs, not, there's not even a strong effort to make them adopt Babylonian religion, particularly. We'll see some of that in Daniel, but even those are, are nominal efforts, not a concerted effort. The, the, the whole focus really in settling them in Babylon is to get them to identify with something larger than their own nation, something larger than their own customs and, and history and background. And if they do that, then the folks back home with whom they're still in contact, after all, the, the Babylonian postal system and the Medo-Persian postal system after it, were those, those uh, postal systems were actually quite efficient. It was possible to send a, a letter from one side of the, the Babylonian or the Medo-Persian empire clear to the other side in about three weeks' time. Now, I don't know what it cost, and uh, it probably, the cost of it probably fell somewhere between the exorbitant rates of our own Pony Express in the 1800s and uh, the U.S. Postal Service of the 1950s and 60s, where you could literally send a penny postcard coast to coast. So the cost of it was probably something between those two extremes. But the point is that the captives or the exiles, let's think of them that way, the exiles along the Kibar Canal, the Grand Canal, are in contact with their folks back home. They're living well. They own property. They own houses. They own fields. They own vineyards. They, they ply their trades. Economically, they're actually pretty well off, better off perhaps than they had been in, in, in Judah. And so they have, from a, a worldly point of view, they have no strong incentive 
from an economic standpoint to want to go back home. Things are pretty good for them. Of course, emotionally, we want to go home. 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 And there are false prophets among them who are very willing to tell them exactly what they want to hear. The elders who are among them, the prominent men, the leaders, the, the family heads and so forth, uh, are very inclined to listen to the false prophets among them. Furthermore, they would certainly be aware of the false prophecies of men like uh, Shemaiah and Hananiah back in Jerusalem. Like I said, that postal service works both ways. And we know that Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel were aware of each other and aware of each other's work and so forth. So there was communication back and forth. These people are Nebuchadnezzar's effort to get Judah to assimilate peaceably and willingly into the Babylonian Empire. On one level, they never do. That is to say, in their sense of self, in their, in their sense of identity, they're not going to give up thinking of themselves as Jews. They're not going to give up thinking of themselves as God's people. They're not going to give, give up thinking of themselves as the chosen people. They are always going to long for their homeland. But on the other hand, economically, linguistically, culturally, as time goes by, they will in many, many ways assimilate into the Gentile culture, the, the Babylonian and the Medo-Persian cultures. So that when 536 comes along and Cyrus gives the decree that they can go home, out of several million Jews, only a few thousand actually will. Go ahead, brother. I saw you waving at me, raising your hand. By the way, uh, I, I am, I've got my, my screen set where I only see about three or four of you. Okay. So if, if, if you raise your hand, wave at me or something like that, and I don't respond, speak up because I can't okay. see everybody's picture. <laughs> no problem. I, I do have a question though. Yes. What did, what did the Jews have to offer them though? It, it wasn't, was it, it wasn't military might. It seemed doesn't, wasn't, I know these were, these were the intellectual. They may have had some uh, educational abilities that they may have used as they used with the, with Dan, we saw that with Daniel, but, what else did they have? They, they weren't. It wasn't military. They, they didn't. They weren't forced labor. They weren't forced uh, military strength. Uh, okay. What did they have that they really that uh, Nebuchadnezzar really wanted from them? Among other things, and this is just sort of a sampling. Uh, territory. Okay. You look at the map. You see where Judah is located. Now go back to the days of Josiah. When Josiah dies, then his son assumes the throne rules for three months, Jehoahaz, mm -hmm. and then is deposed, not by the Babylonians, but by the Egyptians. The king that they put on the throne, Jehoiachin, and forgive me, I, I, I always mix these names up, uh, reigns for about nine years, eight and a half to nine years, and then is deposed, not by the Egyptians, who have now been militarily put in the shade by the Babylonians, but he is deposed by the Babylonians, and his brother replaces him. He goes into captivity, not in Egypt, but in Babylon. Mm -hmm. Now, what did the Babylonians want with uh, Palestine, basically, the, the, the promised land? Understand, look at, look at the map, and you see this is a trade crossroads. And so whoever controls uh, the region of Edom and Judah and Israel and Philistia and uh, Ammon and Moab and, and Syria and so forth, that whole, uh, what we would call the Middle Eastern region between uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the Mediterranean and between uh, Syria and Turkey to the north and Egypt to the south, whoever controls that crossroads controls basically all the major trade routes of the ancient world. Okay. So that's one thing. 
Another aspect of it is that Jewish culture, unlike most of the ancient cultures, even up to the time of the Romans, in the Jewish culture, virtually all of the men were literate. E even the farmer in the field ha had probably attended what we would describe as Hebrew school or, or Talmudic school when he was a child from age uh, five or six up through at least his early teens for the purpose of learning to read so that he could read the scriptures. In, it, it's estimated by some that in ancient Judah, ancient Israel, literacy among the men at any rate uh, may have approached 90 plus percent, whereas in most ancient cultures, only the elites and the, the bureaucracy and a few others would have been literate. And so uh, from that standpoint, the, the, the uh, mercantile class, the, the middle class that uh, Nebuchadnezzar takes and settles along the, the Kibar Canal, these are folks who in a whole host of ways, they offer skills and abilities that are useful to the Babylonian Empire. Uh, think about Daniel and his friends right. uh, incorporated into the into the, the bureaucracy. These were young men who were already knowledgeable and literate, and so they've already got uh, a, a good educational foundation that the Babylonians then can build upon and try to incorporate their teaching on top of that. Okay. Well, in the same way, to perhaps a lesser degree, these roughly 10,000 captives offer a lot of the same uh, advantages and skills and connections and so forth. So uh, the primary consideration for Nebuchadnezzar certainly was, was uh, geopolitical. A secondary consideration would have been the, the uh, societal and cultural assets, you might say, that the Jewish population would offer in his empire. Okay. These are useful people in that respect. All right, I got that. So... Uh, One last question. Did you say his father His father was a priest? Would, would that have made Ezekiel a priest as well? Would he have been? Presumably so, so yes. So okay. he would have been from the tribe of Levi? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, being then exiled, of course, he's obviously not going to have the opportunity or the ability to serve uh, in the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in his uh, priestly course, he's hundreds, if not a thousand miles away mm -hmm. uh, by road. So he doesn't have the opportunity to serve in that respect. On the other hand, uh, he is a man of education, a man of the Torah, a man of the book specifically. So in that role, he already commands uh, a, a certain position, a certain respect among the people, among his, his fellow exiles, even though what he is going to tell them is not going to be popular uh, in, the, in the course of things. Now, Ezekiel was apparently reared in or around Jerusalem, apparently lived there uh, until his, the time of his deportation with King Jehoiachin. Uh, he probably never served in the temple because he was evidently too young, still in his 20s, when he was deported. Uh, but he was undoubtedly very familiar with the temple, with its environment, with the services and the activities and the arrangements of the temple. You know, th this would have been second nature because this is what he'd been trained for right. all of his early life. Now, uh, it, it's, it's obvious that he knew Daniel. You look at Ezekiel chapter 14, uh, verses 14 and 20, and, and you find reference there uh, in, in verse 14, even as these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord, talking about the, the circumstances of Jerusalem. Go down to verse 20, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, talking about uh, Jerusalem still. So clearly he knows who Daniel is. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, he seems to have been uh, in communication with, or at least aware of, the prophecies of Jeremiah and the other prophets in and around Judah at the same time. Now he was married, uh, and his wife dies abruptly during the ninth year of his captivity, dies on the day that the siege of Jerusalem begins. So he goes into captivity, 597 uh, 
BC roughly, arrives there. How long did it take to get there? We don't know. You know, the moving, uh, moving folks who are being exiled but not treated as property would have been a, a slower, uh, more leisurely uh, movement, more likely. Whereas in 586, when the, the temple is destroyed and the city is, is demolished, uh, the people that are captured are, are literally chained up and marched away. They're going to be sold into slavery by and large as punishment for their resistance. So uh, in the, the, on the day that the siege of Jerusalem begins is the day that, that Ezekiel's wife dies. And that would put this about uh, somewhere around 587, maybe as early as 588, depends on how long uh, the siege takes uh, to come to fruition. And, and there's no indication that they have any children. There's no mention of any children. Now, he'd already been in captivity uh, five years when God calls him to serve as a prophet. So that puts us down to about the year 592. If you're looking at the book, this is all uh, background information in the first page or two of chapter 27. Uh, 592, the fifth year of the captivity of King Jehoiachin. Well, that would be the fifth year of Ezekiel's captivity as well. Uh, so they went into captivity at the same time. Uh, at that time, there was among the captives, particularly the roughly 10,000 or so exiles, maybe more. At that time, there was a, a strong hope for a speedy restoration to Judah. They were, they were hoping for the downfall of Babylon. Uh, they, they wanted to see things uh, unravel for the Babylonians. Now, the logic of this may escape us in some respects. It's understandable that they would want to be free. They would want to be independent. We're God's people. We, we don't want to be under anybody's thumb. But the alternative, given their very diminished uh, military and political and socioeconomic status as a nation, the alternative to domination by Babylon in that moment was what? Domination by Egypt. Yeah. It's ironic that over and over and over and over through the centuries, the Jews keep going back to Egypt, to the people who had enslaved them for hundreds of years, to lean on them, to appeal to them, to listen to them trying to seduce Judah into making alliances with them. Like you said last week, this called the Stockholm, the Stockholm syndrome. Exactly. It, it, it makes no sense from our perspective. But they want to go home. Well, we can, we can relate to that in a sense. I mean, uh, Jim Gentry uh, texted a, a moment ago, said, I have to be in Denver next Tuesday. Well, that's great. By the time he gets to Denver, and spends a day or two there, he's going to be ready to come home again. Uh, you know, fish and visitors after three days. Well, it sort of works both ways. After three days, we're kind of ready to be home again, aren't we? This is the condition of the Jews in exile in Babylon. Not only are they eager to go home, not only are they hoping that this is not going to last long, in spite of everything that they're being told by their prophets, there are plenty of false prophets who are encouraging those vain hopes. Now, they want to lean on Egypt against the Babylonians. I, I guess on one, on one level, it's sort of a case of better the devil you know than the devil you don't, uh, in a sense. They're at least familiar with the Egyptians, whereas the Babylonians, with their background and their, their roots in the Assyrian Empire and points even farther east, uh, their customs, their language, their behavior, everything about them is strange. Now, having said that, where do the Hebrews come from originally? They don't come from Egypt. They go back. Remember what the, the Pharisees say to Jesus. We have Abraham as our father. We've never been in bondage to any man, which was patently false. But where did Abraham come from? 
Mesopotamia. Bingo. Abraham came out of these same roots, basically. But that's that's a thousand years ago, roughly. Nine, eight hundred at any rate. They have long since left all that behind. Mm -hmm. And so Babylonian Eastern, far Eastern uh, uh, culture and, and environment is very, very foreign and strange to them. Very uncomfortable in a sense. They're more comfortable with the Egyptians. But Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem initially, 607, 606 BC. That's when Daniel and, and the, the noble the nobility are, are taken away into captivity. In 605, the next year uh, at Carchemish, the Egyptians and the Babylonians meet in battle. Nebuchadnezzar versus Pharaoh Necho, who had previously kind of dominated politics in Judah. 605, Nebuchadnezzar and his army break the back of Necho's Egyptian army. And the Egyptians are never a serious geopolitical threat, never a serious military threat to Babylonian hegemony ever again. Now, they're far enough away from Babylon that just the distance involved prevents the Babylonians from effectively going over and occupying Egypt and controlling it too. But for all practical purposes, they're broken from that point on. Now, uh, the condition of the people of God at this point in time, the condition, the moral and spiritual condition of the Jews, uh, in a word, was, was pathetic. They really didn't even recognize their own spiritual poverty uh from a from the outside looking in the the socio-political circumstances they, they they didn't seem all that bad they weren't uh in just in dire straits uh, economically as a nation they weren't just as wealthy as solomon but th they were not it was not a horrible time for them economically uh when this group that ezekiel is part of were taken into captivity in babylon some of their wealth, their properties, would have been confiscated as spoils of war. But then when they arrive in Babylon, they're not treated as slaves. They're treated as colonists. They're settled into the country. Go down to chapter 24, verses uh, 15 through 18. They're permitted to own land. They're, they're told by Ezekiel, pray for the good of the country that you're in. Uh, those who remain behind in Jerusalem, the lower classes, and then the, the very upper echelons, the palace and so forth, this is a time period in the early part of the captivity, as it were. They're actually kind of prosperous but materially. Uh, and, of course, some of the Jews, like Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they actually occupy high offices in the Babylonian government. You know, you think about that when the when they were taken in, they were made to be like citizens of that citizen area. So oh, no. there was no, there was no, there really wasn't suffering. They were fed the best diets, given the best of, of care. Yeah. But when they were in Egypt and they cried out to God, they were under a hard taskmaster. Yes. Being under that hard taskmaster was different than being under the Babylonians who treated them a little bit differently. But it's, it's an amazing thought that when we are under stress, that's when we cry out to God. Yeah. When we have a taskmaster, we cry out to God. When things are going well, we tend to let we tend to not think about God as much. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and two, in that respect, domination by the Babylonians was a new experience, not just for the Jews, but for all of the conquered peoples that they inherited because the Assyrians and the Syrians, the ancient Syrians before them, and the going back, the previous empires and previous rulers had not been uh, um, like the Babylonians. They'd not been uh, open-minded and generous particularly. They tended to oppress and to misuse. And so the people of God would have cried out, uh, these folks in captivity in Babylon, they really have it pretty good. Now, 
by comparison, even though the folks in Jerusalem have this little window of, of sort of prosperity for a little bit, uh, they're living under a puppet king. They're under the thumb of the Babylonians. They have no might at all. Uh, they are pawns in every respect. And if their socio-political condition was poor, their spiritual condition was appalling because it's at this point that they are, are beginning to introduce idolatry right into Jerusalem proper, even into the, the temple grounds ultimately. Uh, they would not listen to Jeremiah, to any of the faithful men there. That they, Even some of the priests blatantly practice idolatry just out in the open. And their excuse or their, their explanation for this is we're God's people. And no matter what we do, this is God's house, God's temple. And he is not going to allow it to fall no matter what. That's why Jeremiah would say in Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31, a fearful or a wonderful and horrible thing has come to pass in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. Well, go back to the book of Ezekiel, and what do we find? You've got two halves to the book of Ezekiel. The first half, the first 24 chapters, Ezekiel has one basic message to the captives, to the elders and the, the leaders among the captives and the exiles. Jerusalem, the temple, must fall not it's going to or it might it must this is god's plan well he's telling them that the god that they think of as occupying that house is going to be the one who destroys it and that's just more there, there's not enough duct tape in the world to keep their heads together they can't envision that that's that's just incomprehensible plus their folks at home are consoling themselves well we may not perfect we're practicing idolatry we're immoral we're abusing the widows and the orphans and so forth but the temple is still here so we're still okay with god god's okay with it he'll excuse it and it may be that they're looking back to some of the excesses of some of their righteous kings you think about men like uh, david and solomon and some of the unrighteous things that they had perpetrated and yet god blessed them and some of these people are undoubtedly thinking exactly as sometimes people today do well i don't see what the big thing about uh, uh lust and adultery and and fornication and and divorce and remarriage and so forth is god excused that with david so why is it a big deal today the flaw in that reasoning is to claim god excused it you see sometimes we read about things in the bible and assume that because this act is recorded in the Bible, then it has God's approval. But one of the strongest uh, proofs of the inspiration of the scriptures is that it shows us God's people warts and all. If we were writing history, if we were writing the scriptures, we'd only show the good characteristics, and, and the people on the pages of scripture would, would come across as... as, uh, as impossibly perfect the holy spirit doesn't show us god's servants in that way he shows us god's servants with all their weaknesses and faults and venalities and flaws and we make a mistake when we assume that because this person that because david for example is called the man after god's own heart well god excused his sin and it's that those sins are not a big deal they're a huge deal look at the heartache and the suffering and the misery that they brought into his life, not to mention into the lives of, of countless others as well. But these people are looking back, basically saying, well, the, what we're suffering is because of those sins. It's not really that we're so bad. Our ancestors are worse than we were, and, and so forth. And that was not the case. This was a cumulative thing, and they were doing everything they could to add their fair of, uh, of, of sin to the equation. <clears throat> now, concerning the authorship of Ezekiel, uh, 
there have never really been any serious challenges to Ezekiel in the 6th century BC as the inspired writer. Now, in the textbook, you'll find uh, several discussions, uh, several paragraphs of discussion about uh, uh, liberals who, who can't uh, wrap their heads around the idea that, that Ezekiel could possibly have written this, and they try to uh, find excuses to explain that it was penned and written after the Restoration, uh, sometime after exile. In other words, that it's just history, not prophecy, not, not looking forward. Uh, and one of the things that they seize on is the difference in tone and difference in, in subject matter between chapters 1 through 24 and chapters 25 through 48. And the thinking is, well, it couldn't possibly, these two halves could not possibly have writ been written by the same prophet, because in the first half of the book, it's all gloom and doom and despair and, and demand for repentance, and you're going to suffer, and you can't turn it aside. And then in the second half of the book, it's, it's, it's hope and glory and light and anticipation couldn't possibly be written by the same man. But they completely miss that the contrast between the first half and the second half of the book is the difference between before Jerusalem is destroyed and after Jerusalem is destroyed. Before Jerusalem is destroyed, what is Ezekiel's message? Jerusalem must fall because God is a righteous God and you have defiled, you have desecrated everything about his holy city and his people. You have covered yourselves with sin. Your, your sin, your cup of sin is full to the brim and overflowing, and now the wrath of God is coming upon you. So, chapter 24, Jerusalem falls, the temple is destroyed, and the people see their kinfolks coming into Babylon now in chains and slavery, and they're hearing the, the tales of the misery and the suffering and the siege and the, the horrible depravities that have accompanied being conquered and, and resisting until they were conquered. And they're, the captives are just wide-eyed with horror. How can this be? How, can we, how could our God let this happen to us? All the while, Ezekiel is over here on the sidelines, basically trying hard not to say, I told you, I told you. And from this point on, then, his purpose changes in relation to the, the exiles, the captives. Now his purpose from chapter 25 to chapter 48 is to build up, to encourage, to reassure these people whose whole world has come crashing down. These people who are basically beginning to question, well, may, maybe, maybe we've been deluded all this time and our God doesn't really exist. How could he let this happen to us? And Ezekiel's message then is, I've been telling you all along, this is for your correction. And when your punishment is over, God will restore you. He will bring you home and he will uh, renew his covenant with you. But the, the line of demarcation, the, the catalyst for the change in subject matter is the fulfillment of everything he said in chapters 1 through 24, Jerusalem must fall. Now, the, the, the skeptics and the, the critics uh, argue every excuse they can think of to say that this is not written in the 6th century, that this is not written uh, by uh, the actual Ezra, uh, Ezekiel. Uh, they, they try to say it's, it's written from a Palestinian point of view uh, rather than an, a Babylonian point of view. Well, <laughs> Ezekiel is Palestinian. And he is among Jews, even though they're in Babylon. And they communicate with their brethren in Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, his audience, the people he's talking to, are people who would be very familiar with every uh, nuance of Jewish, Jerusalem, uh, Juden, Juden culture and behavior. He's not the, 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 the prophecies of Ezekiel are not for the Babylonians. So there's no reason for him to write from a Babylonian point of view. So that, that, that objection 
doesn't make sense. It doesn't hold any water. Uh, then they, uh, they object, well, he, he writes like he's an eyewitness, so clearly he can't be in, in Babylon and write like an eyewitness. But again, they're, they're trying to explain away prophecy, plus they're discounting the fact that the, the exiles and the people in Judah communicate back and forth, and, and there is news back and forth in the Babylonian uh, bureaucracy, in the Babylonian government, and so forth. Uh, they have that efficient postal system. The, the only way that they can get out of Ezekiel being the inspired penman basically is to rule out God. And of course, the, the liberal, uh, theologically liberal uh, scholars and commentators, that's the whole object of the exercise for them is to take God out of the picture and make this just human history. Hey, Dave. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Jim. You know, if the liberals are true and that's not, you know, that's the excuse that's given for Ezekiel not writing the book. Then I guess Luke didn't write Acts either because Luke didn't see everything that happened to the book of Acts that it recorded. That's right. Much less than the book of Luke. Uh, but again, what's their objective? Their objective is not to get the truth. Their objective is to discredit the scriptures. By the way, let me, let me make a, a, a comment here. Maybe it's not, uh, maybe it goes without saying, but uh, when we talk about in this context of this class, when we talk about the liberals in this, with respect to this textbook and so forth, we're not talking about brothers and sisters in Christ who maybe are a little bit sort of left of center as members of churches of Christ go. We're talking about denominational uh, scholars and commentators and professors and writers in theological schools and seminaries and so forth who are functionally atheists uh, in, in many respects who do not believe the bible is inspired that it's just a human historical document so uh, just at, at the risk of, of not being clear i want to make that clear that that's who we're talking about in this context there are some other uh, details here. There's actually quite a bit of, of good background information in the textbook uh, about uh, uh, alleged discrepancies and, and so forth. Uh, I want to point your attention, though, to uh, page 356 and uh, the, the problem of the fulfillment of e Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Now, Ezekiel 40 through 48 looks forward from Ezekiel's perspective. It looks to restoration. Uh, it talks about the temple and the priesthood and offerings and so forth. And the standout feature of these chapters is that they don't match anything that ever literally occurred in Jerusalem. The temple that Ezekiel describes, the dimensions of it, don't match either Solomon's temple or Zerubbabel's second temple or Herod the Great's enlarged temple in Jesus' day. The temple that Ezekiel describes here was never built physically. And so some of the scholars and commentators and, and a number of denominational folks uh, have a problem with this and uh, Archer, our author of the textbook, tries to make this apply to a, a millennial temple, uh, the church. He, he's correct in some respects in applying this to the church, uh, but then he, he kind of hedges his bets and tries to make this apply to a, a maybe yet to be built temple in the millennium, the thousand year reign and so forth. Uh, suffice it to say that the effort to explain the way ignores the biblical context and the Jewish understanding of this in the first century. We have a, a two-part theme. So the first half of the book, Jerusalem must fall. But the second half of the book from chapter 25, Israel has hope, or Judah, Israel, the generic term, has hope for restoration. God has promised, and God always keeps his promises. And that's the important aspect of this. God always keeps his promises. 
you have some key verses. Uh, some of them, for those of you who preach, probably Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 17 through 21, and chapter 33, uh, verse 11 are the familiar passages. The watchman over the house of Israel, chapter 33 as well. Uh, chapter 18, verse 20, I would suggest to you, if you don't memorize any passages in the book of Ezekiel except one, memorize Ezekiel 18, verse 20, where Ezekiel emphatically spells out the responsibility of the individual. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Uh, there is no degree of sin specified here. Therefore, any and all sin carries the penalty of death. The soul who sins shall die. It doesn't matter if it's a huge sin as man counts it, or if it's a little bitty one. The soul who sins will die. Sin condemns, regardless of the particulars of the sin. It's important for us to understand that we're each individually responsible. And just as a little freebie, by the way, Ezekiel tells us twice in verse 4 and in verse 20, here in Ezekiel chapter 18, that our Calvinist friends in the Presbyterian and the Baptist and, and the various mainstream Protestant denominations, and our Catholic friends as well, they are dead wrong about the idea of being born in sin, original sin, Adam's sin being conveyed on to each successive generation. The soul that sins shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. You don't have, you weren't born with the guilt and the stain of Adam's sin on you. You were born with the consequences of it. And guilt and consequences are poles apart. They're not the same thing. Well, uh, just fast overview of the book. Uh, key chapters, chapter 16 gives us the history of God's dealings with his people, the history of God's dealings with Israel. Chapter 33. Now, this is over in the hopeful part of the, the book. But in chapter 33, God reminds of his judgment against Israel and gives the reasons for it. He's pointing out, I'm not just being capricious. There's a reason I have done this. Then get over to chapter 37, the, the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, and what's the point of that? It's not, as our Mormon friends say, uh, the Bible and the Book of Mormon, the two sticks and so forth. The point of that is God's promise to restore his people is a sure, certain promise. And that promise, by the way, ultimately looks forward to what? Maybe I should say to whom? It ultimately anticipates the perfect sacrifice, the sacrifice whose offering makes all of those Old Testament sacrifices viable and gives them power. That is the offering of Christ. Now, three key words or three key phrases in the book of Ezekiel. Number one, son of man. This expression, son of man, appears about 100 times in the book of Ezekiel, about twice per chapter. And this seems to be Jesus' favorite description of himself. Now, take that fact and jump over to First, P, uh, First Timothy, rather, chapter 2, and what do we find there? There is one mediator between God and man himself, what? Man. Christ Jesus. No wonder he likes this phrase, because it describes that he is fully human, just as he is fully divine. The next key phrase in the book of Ezekiel, they shall know that I am the Lord God. That phrase appears at least 66 times, and what Ezekiel is doing over and over and over again is emphasizing the incomparable superiority of the one true God over all of the false deities that the Babylonians and the various conquered peoples 
were following, including his own Jewish people in their foolishness and idolatry. But then go to chapter 33 and look at chapter 33 and verse 11. In chapter 33, uh, in verses 1 through, 10, through 9, the, the responsibility of Ezekiel as the watchman to the house of Israel is, is renewed. It's reemphasized. Uh, speak to your people and say to them, here's what I'm going to do. I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel, verse 7. You're the sentinel on the wall. You're supposed to be watching out for them. Now, bear in mind, where is Ezekiel when God gives him this charge? He's nowhere near Jerusalem. He's hundreds of miles away in Babylon. But he's among his own people there. And his job is to warn them that just like the folks in Jerusalem are going to suffer, just like the folks in Judah are going to suffer, they too, even though they're in a much better physical circumstance, colonists over here in Babylon, they too need to repent just as urgently as the folks back home because their sins are part of what's bringing this judgment on Jerusalem, just like the folks who are still there. I'm pointing these out, these things out to you. Ezekiel, you're the, the watchman. Your job is to warn them, the people that are here in captivity. But come down then to verse 10. Chapter 33 and verse 10. Son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus have you said, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Now this comes in the second part, the hopeful part of the book. Jerusalem has already been destroyed. The kin folks who were part of the rebellion, they're being marched in as captives and slaves. Things are, are horrible. The temple has been destroyed. These people are distraught. And they're on the verge of giving up not just hope, but belief. And so in verse 11, say to them, as I live, just as sure as I do live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? What Ezekiel is challenged to do here is to to re-emphasize to these people that the terrible suffering that, that their families and their loved ones are going through, the terrible circumstances of the nation's condition were due to their own stubborn persistence in sin. They brought it on themselves. So three key words and phrases, son of man, they shall know that I'm the Lord, the God, the, the Lord God. Why will you die? Three key messages in the book of Ezekiel. Number one, Ezekiel emphasizes again and again the terrible nature of sin. It destroys men, it destroys nations, it destroys everything it touches. There is nothing good about sin. Message number two, individual responsibility. That takes us back to chapter 18, where we were a minute ago. Every individual will suffer for his own sins alone, not for those of any other person. Message number three, the absolute necessity of repentance. Again and again and again, as we saw in chapter 33, back in chapter 14, back in chapter 18, you have to repent if you want to be forgiven. Here's something that's, that's important for us as Christians in the 21st century to emphasize in our preaching and teaching and in our understanding for ourselves. God does not forgive sins because we stop sinning. Let me say that again. God does not forgive our sins because we stop sinning. The man who is a drunk, 
or a drug abuser or a uh, sexual pervert who stops being a drunk or a drug abuser or a, a pervert of some sort for medical reasons. His doctor says, if you don't stop this, it's going to kill you. That man has not repented. He has not been sorry for what he did. He may live in, in, in glorious memory, as it were, of his perversions. We must repent in order to be forgiven. God does not forgive simply because we stop. There must be a change of heart that produces the change in behavior. Now, let's talk just for a moment about Ezekiel's methods of teaching. Ezekiel is unusual among the prophets. He uses allegories. Most prophets do not. He uses symbols. Most prophets do not. He presents visions. Some prophets do, but not many. Uh, his use of symbols was very graphic. Uh, behaviors, uh, models, things like that. Uh, he drew the, the siege of Jerusalem in chapter 4. He, he made a model of it or drew a, a, a diagram of it on a clay tablet uh, in, in order for the people to see and understand what's going on. Uh, in chapter 4, in verses 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, this, this long time period of lying on this side for so many days, 300 and, and so many days, and lying on this side for 40 more days, uh, out in a public space, that was, that was very vivid to the people. Uh, cutting and scattering his hair in chapter 5, representing the various fates of Jerusalem's inhabitants. This is an action that in the Jewish culture would have been interpreted as a gesture of, of mourning, of distress, of, of terrible upset. And it would have excited comment to all those who saw it. And they would not have just questioned him about it. They'd have talked about it amongst themselves. The visions that he reveals, and there are several of them in the book, they serve the same purpose. They carry the same message as the symbolic actions. They reinforce the doom of the nation and the hope of the remnant after captivity has been fulfilled, after the punishment is finished. Now, I said a minute ago, he uses allegories, and that makes Ezekiel unusual among the prophets. An allegory is a lot like a parable. They're both illustrative stories. Now, how do we define a parable? G give me a quick one-sentence definition of a parable. Earthly story with the heavenly, heavenly, before we would earthly say. Story, maybe. spiritual story with a, uh, or earthly story with spiritual meaning, with a heavenly interpretation. An allegory, uh, a parable is a familiar illustration with a spiritual application. It has one basic point. Think about the pearl of great price that Jesus talked about. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the basic point of the pearl of great price? It had value. Bingo. It was not just valuable. It was so valuable that this man was willing to sell everything in order to obtain it. What was the man's name? I don't know. Where was he from? We might suppose he's probably from somewhere in Judah. He's seemingly a Jew, but maybe not because there were Jews all over the world at that point in time. Uh, where was the pearl? What town was he in? How much did he pay for it? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. A parable has one basic point, and that one basic point is the only important part of it. The, the man's name, immaterial. How much did he pay for it? Everything. How much was that? We don't know. It doesn't matter. An allegory, unlike a parable, is an illustrative story where all of the details have spiritual significance. And so in chapter 15, in verses 1 through 8, where Ezekiel talks about Judah being the good vine that becomes worthless wood, the comparisons there, the details illustrate the point. 
uh, in chapter 16, where he talks about uh, Israel being the foundling child, uh, uh, an abandoned child whom God adopts and, and raises up to be this beautiful girl that he marries, who then deserts him to become a prostitute. All of the details there carry the story along, and the details develop the story. Uh, go to chapter 19, the lions that are taken captive. Those represent King Jehoahaz and King Jehoiachin. Ezekiel is almost alone among the prophets in using allegories. There are a very few others in the scriptures. Now, uh, Roman Catholicism tends to allegorize everything in the Bible and try to make every tidbit of information into uh, having some massive spiritual application. But that reads into the scriptures something that's not there. The important thing about allegories is that the scriptures generally identify them as that. Well, that, today, I, have, I have a question. I'm, since we're on this line, in, in Ezekiel chapter 28, I've been studying a lot lately in, about uh -huh. it, and I'm, I'm just curious, is this a depiction of Satan here? Uh, he's talking about the beauty of Satan and the, all that he all he's, was adorned with and all of that. And Are we talking about the, the day star and Lucifer and so forth? Yes. And, well, this, that's, that's Isaiah, Isaiah, but in Ezekiel right. 28, he starts out talking about the king of Tyre, right? but in uh, verse 13, uh, uh, 17, 12, he goes on about, it's like he's talking about the devil. Right. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre. Say to him, thus says the Lord to God, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, in uh, every precious stone was your covering and so forth. The, the, uh, the application there, the point there, is th this is not, uh, in its context, this is not a depiction of Satan, but rather this is a, a, uh, an image, if you will, of, uh, let me get to my, to my notes on that particular chapter. Mm -hmm. This is an image of the people of Tyre, the nation of Tyre uh, in basically in poetic language. Mm -hmm. That is to say, God is telling them, look, you, you had every opportunity, every blessing, uh, every potential that anybody else did. You were as good, as, as beautiful as anybody else. Come down to verse 15. Uh, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. That, that's a, an, an important uh, companion passage to chapter 18, verses 4 and 20. That is, that uh, it's the actions of the individual that bring condemnation, not the actions of a, an ancestor or a parent. Well, the parent of Tyre, Sidon, remember Jezebel, uh, Ahab's bride, is a Sidonian princess. Uh, Tyre, the city out on the, uh, out on the bay, as it were, is a city whose, whose uh, uh, status as a, uh, an impregnable fortress is just legendary, as it were, as far as their people were concerned. Well, uh, I believe if you go along in the, the textbook over to the second I may be ahead of myself here to the second section on Daniel. Let me back up. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a picture is what I'm looking for in the, the textbook. Uh, the, the city of Tyre ultimately is going to be destroyed. Page hey, 354. Uh, that's not the picture I'm looking for. Yeah, yes, it is, 355, 355. City of Tyre. That, that's, that's not, <laughs> I'm sorry, what I was seeing in my mind is a picture in a different book. Okay. Uh, but yes, that's, that's the picture, and, the, and the, the caption there gives you the, the circumstances of it. Uh, when Ezekiel talks about this, it comes in the context of a whole series of prophecies 
against foreign nations. Now, uh, Tyre, the, the Phoenicians of Tyre, had been at one point allies of the Jews. Remember in the days of King David, it was his arrangement with Hiram, the king of Tyre, for skilled craftsmen and supplies that led to the construction of his palace and the materials uh, that would ultimately uh, go into the building of the temple. Uh, but <clears throat> like these other nations that worshiped idols, uh, judgment is coming upon them as well. Now, in the context here uh, of chapters, I want to say it's 25 through 32, uh, you have Ezekiel talking to the elders, talking to the leaders of the exiles, emphasizing against their complaint, well, God is an unjust God if he destroyed uh, Jerusalem, if he destroyed our temple, if he, if he uh, con dis demolishes us as a nation, how can he be a just God when all of these other nations are worse than we were? And so Ezekiel goes through, much like Jeremiah does, and gives prophecy after prophecy. Here's what God's going to do with the Egyptians and the Edomites and the people of Tyre and, and so forth and all of these different nations, assuring them Basically, God is going to judge them too, in that he's, he's accomplishing a twofold purpose. He, he's pointing out God has not been unjust to judge us, and our judgment for our sins has to do with us. Their sins, these other nations, they don't, they don't impact our judgment. The, the argument like little children caught misbehaving, the argument of the elders is, but they're worse than we are. They're worse than we are. God ought to punish them first. Well, you take two five-year-olds caught misbehaving, and what does one say to mama about the other one? Oh, well, well little Johnny did more than I did. Uh, you, you ought, it's, it's not fair for you to, to paddle me till you've paddled him. Well, did you misbehave? Well, yes, but little Johnny did more. That has nothing to do with your punishment. That's, what, that, that's the first part of what Ezekiel is illustrating to these people, is that God's punishment on them, their captivity, their exile, their suffering, has to do with their sins. And what everybody else in the world does has nothing to do with that. But on the other hand, what he's also emphasizing to these people in this period where their temple's been destroyed, their nation's been destroyed, their city has been demolished, their kinfolks are being sold into slavery, they are seeing the fruit of immense suffering because of sin. What he's also emphasizing to them is, this does not mean that our God has been conquered and overwhelmed by the Babylonians. This is God's judgment against us, and our God is the only God, and therefore, here's what he's going to do to this nation, here's what he's going to do to this nation, here's what he's going to do to this nation, and when we get over here to chapter 28, we talk about the Prince of Tyre, in a sense, uh, God is saying, Phoenicians, you had everything going for you. You, you, were, you were close to my people. You had godly influences. Uh, you, you could have done well. And look how far you've fallen. So we've got the prophecy against the, the king of Tyre and, and the arrogance of the Tyrians. And then you come down later in the chapter, you get down to verse 20. Here's prophecy against Sidon, the, the whole countryside of the Phoenicians. Uh, set your face against Sidon. Prophesy against her. Uh, behold, I am against you. I will manifest my glory in your midst, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There's that key phrase again and again and again, all of these heathen peoples that don't even believe in God, they shall know that I am the Lord. They would experience suffering. They would experience punishment. W would they have a prophet among them to tell them what, what's going on? I don't know. We don't have any record of one. Now, a hundred plus years before, God sent Jonah to Nineveh, mm -hmm. and those people repented. But more recently, he sent Nahum to give them a warning, and they ignored him. Do these people have prophets from God? If they do, we don't have any record of it other than 
the writings here that would tend, if only in retrospect, to confirm what they should have known all along. Remember, just because they were idolaters, just because they were not part of the Commonwealth of Israel, didn't mean they were without excuse. Ignorance is not an excuse because what do we know? God is not far from any one of us. We have the responsibility to seek after him, to feel after him and find him, and he's willing to be found. Mm -hmm. You go to chapter 29, now he turns the guns against Egypt and so forth. So as, as, we, as we go along through here, uh, he, uh, he presents these, these visions, these symbols, uh, these allegories. He's trying to get his people to see what's coming to Jerusalem is the result of our sins. After the fact, he's trying to get them to look back and say, now we understand, but don't give up hope because just as sure as God warned you of destruction and carried it out, now he's promising you restoration. You need to keep faith with him. If he fulfilled that promise, he's going to fulfill this one. And sure enough, he did. Well, a, a very simple outline of the book, four parts. And then we'll, uh, I think we'll take our break and come back and talk about Daniel and see how far we can go beyond that. Very simple outline of the book. Chapters one, two, three, the call and the commission of Ezekiel. Here, here's the stage being set for Ezekiel to serve as a prophet. He's about 30 years old when he's called to be a prophet. So that would have been the normal time of his priestly service to begin. And he's going to then serve uh, basically for the balance of his priestly years, about 20 years. Chapters 4 through 24, the, the rest of the first half, a catalog of the sins of the nation and her impending doom. Jerusalem must fall. Jerusalem shall fall. You know, these people are saying, oh, the temple, the temple, the temple is, is, is the guarantee that we're okay with God. And and just like Jeremiah emphasizes to the people in Jerusalem, Ezekiel is emphasizing to the captives, if that's what you're putting your trust in, God's going to take that away from you to get you to see his point. And that's exactly what he does. Then in chapters 25 through 32, but what about all these nations? All right, here's what God's going to do with this one and this one and this one and this one. Prophecies against the idolatrous Gentile nations, including the Babylonians. And then chapters 33 to 48, now Judah, build up your hope. God has promised restoration for the penitent remnant. And if you repent, God will restore you. That's what this is all about. Punishment, correction, discipline, so that Judah will repent. Because remember, what purpose does Judah serve in God's plan? Heir to the king is coming through that line. Bingo. They are the pipeline for the Savior, not just for Judah, but for all of us. So that's the point. All right. Uh, there, there is a lot more that we could talk about. There is, there is a lot of good information. Read the sidebars and, and look at the outline of, of uh, Ezekiel. And take a look at the maps uh, in the textbook. There's some great maps in this textbook. Uh, very clear and vivid and, and some great photography as well. And the sidebars are very helpful. Uh, let's see. I think that's all the information from the text that I wanted to, to give you. Comments or questions before we take a break, and then we'll come back and talk about Daniel. Okay, well, let's take a break then. We'll, uh, it's 7.14. We'll come back uh, in uh, 15 minutes at 7.29, basically. 7.30 now. It says 7.15. Thank you very much. Get back to the book of Daniel. And Daniel is an interesting book on a number of levels, uh, not the least of which is because it's a comparatively short book. Uh, it's interesting that uh, 
it has basically the same number of chapters as Zechariah, uh, and yet it is counted among the scholars as Daniel is counted as a major prophet, and Zechariah as one of the 12, a minor prophet. Uh, they're approximately the same length in terms of content, volume. Uh, Daniel is a member of the tribe of Judah, uh, the royal family, if not the royal house, uh, descended from one of the most prominent families in that tribe. You look at Daniel chapter 1 and verse 3, the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace, and teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So, uh, his name, Daniel, alternatively means either God is judge or God is my judge. It depends on on the, the placement of the the uh, a letter in the middle of the name. Uh, we don't know anything of his early life. We don't know with certainty how old he was when he went into captivity. Uh, and in one sense, he was uh, in, in some ways more of a captive initially than Ezekiel. Uh, he goes into captivity earlier, about 605, 606, 605 BC. This is when Nebuchadnezzar first uh, flexes his muscles and, and uh, deposes Jehoahaz and installs uh, uh, Jehoiachin or Jehoiakim, and uh, we don't know anything about his, his family background other than he is of the, the royal family of the, the tribe of Judah. Uh, he probably was well-educated, both in the scriptures and in secular knowledge. Uh, if he was a teenager, as seems probable, maybe 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, somewhere in there, uh, he would have completed uh, the first phases of his studies as a Jewish man. Uh, he seems to have been somewhere in the, in the mid to late teens, he and his, his companions. Uh, his outstanding character and the, his outstanding abilities, he and his friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as, as we more familiarly know them, they're, those are captivity names, Chaldean names. Their proper names are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, they were selected to become uh, servants, bureaucrats, uh, and they distinguished themselves in their determination to maintain their, their purity and their faithfulness to God. Uh, now, Daniel is unusual in that he lives throughout the entire period of captivity. He becomes God's spokesman in the palace in Babylon, in Shushan, and lives throughout the, the 70 years of Babylonian dominance, down into the time of the Chaldean, uh, the, the Medo-Persian Empire, and several years into that. He was probably in his 90s, at least, at the time of his death. Uh, he served several Babylonian, at least three Babylonian monarchs, and, and at least one Persian, Medo-Persian uh, monarch in various high offices. Now, uh, there is no record of an explicit prophetic call for Daniel. We have, an, unlike Ezekiel, where chapters one through two and three, God speaks to Ezekiel and says, this is my job for you, or Jeremiah, where God calls Jeremiah to be his prophet. We don't have anything like that for Daniel. He lived, worked, the same time frame as both of those men and others. He was in a much more influential circle of people, much more influential position. Uh, he was undoubtedly largely removed in some ways from the fellowship of his fellow Jews. Now, when he was in training, he had Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah around him, along with other Jewish youths who evidently did not measure up to his standard of faithfulness to God. Uh, he was, without doubt, a voice of counsel in the palace that favored God's people. Now, one of the key phrases in the book of Daniel ties in very well with Ezekiel. Ezekiel emphasizes again and again and again, they shall know that I am the Lord God. 
Daniel emphasizes the most high rules, the most high rules, and that ties in well in speaking to the people of Judah who are in captivity because of God's will. Now, uh, he is a contemporary with Ezekiel, with Jeremiah, with Habakkuk, with Obadiah, with Zephaniah, with Huldah the prophetess. Uh, all of these people God is using to try to turn his people to repentance. Uh, the socio-political circumstances for Daniel are, are much like they are in Ezekiel. Uh, the captives who come nine years after Daniel goes into captivity. Now, Daniel and his companions they are captives in more captives in the sense that that they're not just removed from home and settled they're removed from home and given particular jobs for what it's worth it's very likely according to a, a lot of what i have read at any rate it's very likely that these <clears throat> that these young men were castrated at the time that they were brought into babylonian service uh, that's that's a, a very unpleasant thought for us, but that would have been very typical of the time, uh, and and uh, that may explain why we don't have any record of a wife or a family associated with Daniel. Uh, he is a captive, but he's a, a captive in very luxurious circumstances. He lives in the palace. He he is offered the finest food available. Of course, we know how that that goes down with he and his friends. Uh, preferring a, a, a pure diet as opposed to a, a diet that contradicts their teaching and their, their values. Even though they are, in a sense, captives, they're not just turned loose to better society. They're given specific jobs and responsibilities. They're taught all the wisdom of the Chaldeans and so forth, kind of like Moses was in, in Pharaoh's court in, in one sense. Uh, in the meantime, the people in Judah uh, are their circumstances are just steadily ticking down now in 597 Ezekiel and his group come in and are settled in Babylon and their circumstances are actually pretty good and prosperous overall but the nation as a whole is in sorry shape now unlike Ezekiel the authorship of Daniel has been just constantly challenged and critiqued, uh, questioned by critics. Uh, they want to, dis, to, to uh, discredit the book of Daniel. And part of that is because the prophecies, the predictive prophecies of Daniel are so specific and so easily applied to New Testament events and intertestamental events world events between Daniel and the time of the Messiah. Uh, the fact that the book was originally written bilingually, uh, roughly chapter 2, about verse 4 down through about chapter 7, verse 8, were written in Aramaic, from what we can tell, which is a, a Middle Eastern dialect similar to Hebrew, but it would have been much more familiar to uh, all of the peoples of that area. Uh, for what it's worth, Matthew appears to have also been written in Aramaic as well. <clears throat> but the rest of the book was written in Hebrew. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, Archer gives a, a pretty good explanation of, of a logical reason for that. In, in talking about the authorship of Daniel, he goes through a, a whole series of uh, arguments for later dates and so forth. The Jewish canon places Daniel uh, among the the sacred writings rather than among the prophets, uh, the, that uh, Ecclesiasticus, which is an apocryphal book, makes no reference to Daniel, although it talks about all of the other prophets, uh, challenges to historical accuracies about uh, what year this king began to reign and so forth. You can read all of that for yourself. Uh, Archer actually does a good job of dispelling a lot of these uh, challenges uh, to the authorship of Daniel, and particularly, he gives a good explanation about the identity of Darius the Mede. That picks up on uh, page 366, uh, and he goes through a good, concise explanation of that. Uh, but if you want to uh, come over here to page 370 and look at the uh, 
it's under number two, grammatical evidences for the early date of Daniel's Aramaic. That's a roundabout way of saying there's no reason to challenge Daniel's authorship of this book. One of the complaints of the, the liberal scholars is, well, part of it's written in Aramaic and part of it's written in Hebrew. So clearly it was written by two different men at different times. Well, uh, chapters two through seven written in Aramaic basically are written for common consumption by anybody that happens to pick up the book in Babylon. Whereas chapter one and chapters eight through 12, which are the messianic anticipating chapters, are written in Hebrew because they particularly relate to the destiny of Judah. And they don't particularly uh, concern all of the other peoples. Now, in a general sense, they do, because we're talking about the Messiah. But in a specific sense, they don't. So that's, that would be written uh, in Hebrew, because that's a particular interest to the Jews, and not to uh, the Chaldeans and so forth. And so he gives a, a good, succinct explanation of that at the end of the first chapter on Daniel. You'll notice that chapters 28 and 29 in the textbook are both about Daniel. And he gives a lot in chapter 2, uh, chapter 29, about uh, arguments for a Maccabean era uh, authorship and, and so forth. Uh, I, I would direct your attention to the chart of the history of kingdoms on page 376, uh, these different kings that, that ruled and the different empires. This, this corresponds to Daniel's image, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's image of the golden head, silver breast, uh, brass belly, iron legs, iron and clay feet uh, in the book of Daniel. And you also have some uh, a picture on 377 of Ahasuerus, Xerxes, which corresponds actually down to, toward the time of Queen Esther later on. Uh, good information here. Uh, additional proofs for Daniel's authorship, for Daniel being the actual author. Uh, I would suggest that the strongest argument in favor of Daniel is the very first one that Archer presents here on page 379, and that is Matthew 24 and verse 15. Jesus speaks of the abomination of desolation that Daniel the prophet foresaw. Jesus, in other words, talks about Daniel and references a passage in the book of Daniel as a real historical figure and as the writer of that passage. And that, I would suggest that in itself is the single strongest evidence in favor of Daniel being the actual author of the book. Now, there are others here, some good uh, explanations of, of uh, calculating the, the 69 weeks of Daniel and so forth. Uh, I would point out, Archer is a millennialist. So he tends to come to things like this and look for a way to lead these things into the idea of an earthly millennial kingdom. When you know that up front, then you know he's going to go in that direction when he gets there. But now let's talk about the book of Daniel uh, generally. The theme of the book of Daniel is really very simple. The most high rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. Daniel chapter 2 uh, and about verse 44. And Daniel 4 and verse 17. That is God's in charge. Uh, 244, the God of kingdom will, uh, God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Daniel 4 and verse 17, God rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will. The whole point of the book of Daniel is to demonstrate God's sovereignty, God's rulership in the affairs of men. Now think about where Daniel is when he is presenting these prophecies. Daniel is in the court of a heathen idolatrous king, Nebuchadnezzar. Is he presenting these prophecies to Nebuchadnezzar? Undoubtedly. But he's also conveying this information surely to the captives with whom Ezekiel is associated, to his fellow Jews as well. Uh, in the book of Daniel, 
he's going to emphasize essentially to everyone, my God is in charge. Now, that would seem to be offensive to Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, we'll talk about Nebuchadnezzar going out and eating grass in the field and so forth uh, before we're all done. But in presenting this idea that it's my God who's in charge and my God who has put you on the throne and so forth, what is Daniel also doing as he presents that information to Nebuchadnezzar? He's in, in, in emphasizing my God is using you, is blessing you, is giving you this authority and this power for his purposes. You have his approval in this and this and this. You have his approval in, in conquering my people and bringing them into captivity and so forth. You are his instrument. And so when Daniel presents these things in the court, he is not doing this in a... a condemning way particularly, but in an informing way, uh, I would hesitate to say an evangelistic way, but he is, is emphasizing uh, that Nebuchadnezzar needs to recognize that his understanding of his gods and his various deities and so forth doesn't fit the facts. Here are the facts that fit. Now, we talked a little bit last week about the fact that that from a, a political and a military and an economic and a cultural point of view, there is no reason for the Babylonian empire to exist. It doesn't make sense from any of those perspectives. You, you see the Babylonian empire just abruptly subsume the Assyrians of whom they had previously been a vassal state and, and rise to prominence like, a, like a, a meteor streaking across the sky. And then they fall almost as fast, less than a hundred years later. But they served God's purpose. And that's the whole reason for their position and their existence. And that's one of the things that Daniel wants Nebuchadnezzar and his successors to understand. You think you're the greatest power in the world, but you're not. You're the greatest power in the world because the greatest power in the universe has set you here for his purpose. And as long as you honor his purpose, he empowers you. And it took some persuading, but Nebuchadnezzar eventually sees this, at least at one point. Now, a couple of key phrases, key words. Dominion is the key word. It appears about 15 times in 12 chapters, the book of Daniel. And it emphasizes the rulership of God over all humanity, over all human affairs. And then the key phrase, the most high rules. And that's, a, that's not just a, a, an emphatic statement for Nebuchadnezzar. That's also a reassurance to the Jewish people, that our God is in charge. God, in his sovereignty, is taking care of them. He's correcting them. He's disciplining them, but he's also preserving and protecting them. Now, uh, a basic outline of the book of Daniel. You've got two halves, kind of like uh, Ezekiel, but in the first half, chapters one through six, you have uh, Daniel's biography. You have the, the stage being set, uh, the events that take place in Babylon. You find out how Daniel comes to Babylon, chapter one, uh, his, his youth, his education, uh, how he is abruptly torn from home and family with his friends and taken into a strange land. It is a huge, huge tribute to the quality of their spiritual education that these young men, perhaps 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, were determined to maintain their faith, even in a strange land. <clears throat> it might have been very easy for them, and cer certainly for uh, many of their companions, to justify going along with the Babylonians. We're over here, we're separated, nobody's ever gonna know, God knows. And so they keep their faith in chapter one. 
Now, chapter two, Daniel is going to interpret the image that uh, Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dream that he can't recall, that he can't remember. And that's going to bring him to the emperor's, the king's attention in a, in a very positive way. Chapter three turns the, the focus away from Daniel entirely to his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It's interesting, by the way, the, the four captivity names, Belshazzar, and uh, Belteshazzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these are all names in Chaldean that are associated with Babylonian deities. These are the names that the Babylonians imposed on these men of God. And yet, even though their names are associated with pagan deities, they keep their faith. In chapter three, their faith is these men, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, are put to the test in the fiery furnace. And we'll talk a little bit about that as, as we go along. Chapter four, the king has another dream of a tree that he doesn't understand, and Daniel interprets that. And then we have a, a gap time-wise between the end of chapter four and chapter five, where we skip down through time, through most of the period of captivity. Daniel is now not remotely a young man. He is a fully mature older man, probably in his uh, 70s or so at least at this point, maybe in, into his 80s at this point. And Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who is co-regent with his father. Now his father, Nabopolassar, is the king and the overall ruler, but he's out in the field in battle. And Belshazzar, who is uh, co-regent with him, elevated to the status of basically secondary king, he's the king on the spot, is in the palace and throws the big party, a sacrilegious feast, that when he calls for the sacred vessels from the temple in Jerusalem that has now been destroyed, prompts the handwriting on the wall, many, many tekel huparsin, which means you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting, you've come up short. Daniel interprets the sign, and at the end of the chapter, it's fulfilled, the Babylonians are overthrown, and the Medo-Persians take over. This would place the date of that event about 538, 539 BC, right at the, basically the end of the captivity. Now, we talked about the, the dating of the captivity a little bit last week, and how that it can be counted from 606 to 536, or if you start the, the captivity period at the destruction of the temple in 586, then it goes down into the early 400s with the reconstruction of the temple. Either time frame works in terms of the volume of time, uh, but the typical dating is five, uh, 606 down to 586 for most scholars. Chapter 6 brings us to Daniel's very old age. He is now at least in his late 80s, probably in his early 90s, and he is placed in high office in the rulership of Darius the Mede. And there's, like I said, Archer gives us some good information, a good explanation about who this Darius actually is in relation to Cyrus the Persian, how uh, that this is probably Gubaru, uh, as, as he's known in archaeological records who was, again, sort of the king on the scene, the ruler on the scene under the overall rulership of Cyrus. Uh, Daniel is endangered by jealous maneuvering politicians in chapter six, and at the end of the chapter, he is delivered from the lion's den. That's the first half of the book, the biography of Daniel. The second half, chapter seven through 12, concentrates on Daniel's visions and prophecies about coming world kingdoms coming from Daniel's point of view and the kingdom of Christ. So you have visions that take place that Daniel experiences during the reign of Belshazzar. And this is in chapter seven and eight. This is coming near the end of the captivity period. He's either just a couple of years away or he's about 20 years away, but either way, they're on the downhill side of captivity. They'll soon be allowed to go home. The first vision is of four beasts, 
representing four world empires in chapter seven. Those four world empires correspond to uh, Darius, the, Med the Medo-Persians down through Alexander the Great and the division of his kingdom down to the time of the Romans and the coming of the Christ. And then in chapter eight, the vision of two beasts, the Medo-Persians and Alexander the Great followed by his generals. Now in chapter nine, now we come down to the time of Darius. So in chapter eight, the stage is being set. In chapter nine, Daniel is realizing he is seeing these prophecies already beginning to be fulfilled in his lifetime as the change from the Babylonian Chaldean Empire to the Medo-Persian Empire takes place while he's still alive. Chapter nine is Daniel's penitent prayer. And, and his prayer is not for himself only, but it's an acknowledgement of the sins of his people, his nation. And it, it ought to make us think about the, the words of Solomon in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34, uh, particularly in the context of our national circumstances, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, at the end of chapter nine, we have the angel Gabriel uh, revealing to Daniel the 70 heptads or the 70 weeks, the 77s uh, as it sometimes is described. And that's symbolic. It corresponds to the time period between Daniel and the coming of the kingdom of Christ. Now, chapters 10, 11, and 12 shift the scene away from Darius, the basically the king on the scene, the local king, to Cyrus, the overall ruler, the Persian, who is in charge of everything. And in the relationship, in the coalition of the Medo-Persian Empire, although there was a, an, an alternating uh, relationship between the two because it was a, a coalition kingdom, a coalition empire of sorts, the Persians always basically overshadowed the Medes. They were the dominant half of the coalition. And so Cyrus, the Persian, is the overall ruler here. And Daniel, in chapter 10, uh, sees a vision of a man uh, clothed in linen by the river Hidekel and has to, to begin to understand that. Chapter 11 deals with prophecies about Greece and Persia. That is, Persia is going to confront Alexander. Of course, Alexander is, at this point, still basically 200 years in the future. And then chapter 11, verse 34, down into the early part of chapter 12, are prophecies concerning the end, the time of the end, or the conclude, concluding era of human history. In other words, Christ forward. Uh, the rest of chapter 12, verses 4 through 13, is God's final word through Daniel. Now, one of the things that stands out about Daniel is, like Ezekiel to a lesser extent, Daniel is, <clears throat> is apocalyptic literature. That is, much of chapters 7 through 12, as well as some of the earlier visions, is figurative. It's symbolic. It has application. Uh, in the notes that, that uh, I sent you, uh, on uh, page four of this, the material about Daniel, there are a number of uh, basic rules for understanding apocalyptic or symbolic literature. And this, apply, this would apply to Ezekiel. This would apply to the symbols in Daniel. This would apply to the symbols in Zechariah. This also would apply to the Revelation at the end of the New Testament. Uh, about a dozen basic rules there. Let the author give his own interpretation. If Daniel tells us what this means, that's what it means. Here's where our dispensational and millennialist friends sometimes get way off the biblical reservation, because the prophet will tell us this is the interpretation of the symbol, or the Christ will come along and tell us this is the interpretation of this, and they want to take that and run way over here and make it fit their theology instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to explain what this means. The interpretation ought to be rule number two, according to the 
general as well as the special scope or setting of the message. What's the general context? Is it Old Testament, New Testament? To who is it written? Who wrote it? When was it written? Where was it written? And so forth. That's the general context. What's the immediate context? Does the writer give us any information about who he's talking about? Woe unto you, uh, this nation or that nation, that sort of thing. If there is a literal account, a historical account of what is being prophesied, compare the symbol and the history. And the figurative or the symbolic account is explained by the historical event. It does not contradict it. Here again is where our millennialist and, and dispensational friends sometimes get way off track because they try to take the symbolic images and make them fit their theology instead of the historic events that are recorded in the scripture that parallel them. Uh, there are other things here. Compare similarities, compare differences. What's, what's similar, what's different uh, in these various things. Look at the facts of history and the facts of, of biography. Uh, when we look at history, we see the, the, the ram with one, horn, one great horn. Well, uh, historically, when we begin to look at history, who comes and pushes against uh, the Medo-Persians? Well, uh, the goat rather, not the ram, pushes against the great ram. Well, this is Alexander. Historically, we have this tension going on. Uh, don't try to demand too many points of comparison. Don't try to press the figure beyond its main point. Apocalyptic literature symbolic or figurative literature usually has one basic point. There may be some, some related details, but it's making one basic point. So don't try to allegorize it and make every little detail have eternal or earth shattering significance. Sometimes a detail is just a detail uh, for what it's worth. The figures in the scriptures are not always used consistently. A lion does not always signify the same thing. We go back to Genesis chapter 49, and Judah is a lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah is the Christ. But we also see the lion depicted in apocalyptic literature in less flattering ways, different representations. It's not always the same application. Uh, Figures are sometimes used to explain other figures. And perhaps this is the most important thing. Sometimes the type, that is the shadow, and the anti-type or the substance are in view at the same time. When Daniel talks about the Christ, the imagery he uses has an immediate application but it also anticipates the coming of the Christ. Uh, you've got in the notes, you've got a, a chronology there. Uh, and that was, I forget where that's taken from. Uh, doesn't say, I forgot, neglected to put that in. Uh, but that's a pretty typical chronology of events from Daniel down to the time of, of the Christ, or just before the time of the Christ. Let's talk a little bit about the text of Daniel, just just rapidly, and then we need to move on, uh, time permitting, into Chronicles and Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Esther. Uh, as I said, the first half is Daniel's biography, basically, and the biographies of his companions. Uh, chapter one takes us from uh, the conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 606 uh, into Babylonian uh, service for Daniel. Jehoiakim is the king. He is taken away into captivity in Babylon because he had rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it's at this time that all of the uh, golden service, the goblets, the plates, and things like that are taken from the temple and, and taken away into Babylonian uh, possession. Jehoiakim is kept alive in the Babylonian court. He is basically there as a trophy of war. Uh, a, a trophy of, of victory. Uh, 
keeping him alive, having a king as, as his pet in the, in the palace, along with all the other conquered kings. That's, that's a, a testimony to how great Nebuchadnezzar is. And that was typical of a lot of the ancient empires to, to do this, to show I'm, I'm so great that I can afford to keep these guys as, as my uh, uh, entertainment in my court, basically. In the same way, taking the, the temple service from Solomon's temple and putting it into a, a, a pagan temple, supposedly much like the Philistines taking the Ark of the Covenant and putting it in the temple of Dagon back in, in the days of the kings, uh, or, or back in the, the days of King Saul, rather, that supposedly demonstrates our God is greater than your God. Of course, that didn't work out too well for the Philistines, but here, this is part of God's punishment for Judah. Uh, the fact that God does not in any way retaliate against the Babylonians should demonstrate to the Jews that should be an object lesson to the Israelite people how they have uh, been unfaithful and mistreated God, and he's using pagan people to punish them for it. Now, all of these events, this, this uh, invasion at this point by Nebuchadnezzar in 606, this is because of Jehoiakim's evil doing and rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar, but more importantly, against God. And Daniel is taken into captivity because uh, he is part of the royal family. He may be extended kin folks, but he's still part of the royal family. Chapter 1, verses 8 through 16, emphasizes particularly Daniel's determination to do right. Uh, he kind of takes the lead here. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah seem to be right there with him. And for what it's worth, The king's intentions, Nebuchadnezzar's intentions in appointing all of this uh, unclean but rich food for them, his intentions were, were benevolent. Uh, he, he's trying to give them the best of everything in a sense to show them, uh, I have great plans for you. I want you to be well taken care of. You are important to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you in a very positive way. Well, of course, uh, what is presented is unclean for the Jews, whether it's pig or catfish or, or what have you. Uh, the details are not given, but it's unclean. And Daniel proposes the comparison test. He and his fellow Hebrews will eat very plain and religiously acceptable food, and the other captives will eat what's set before them. Well, let's see how who, who looks better after 10 days. Well, one thing that stands out here that perhaps you, you don't notice right off the bat. <clears throat> notice how this is proposed. In verse 11, Daniel says to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat. This is the English Standard Version. Vegetables to eat, water to drink, then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. Something stand, ought to stand out here that is not explicitly stated. Daniel does not say, test us for 10 days, and if we don't look better, we'll eat the unclean food. That's not part of the, the proposal. Test us for 10 days, let, it, let us do this for 10 days, then compare us and you do what you think is best. He never says, we'll give in. Now there's confidence here. Confidence based on trust in God. They fared better than their fellow captives and they're held high in, in high esteem, not just by the, the chief of the eunuchs and so forth, which by the way, that implies that they probably had been castrated as well, but by the king himself. Notice verse 17 in chapter one. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, 
and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. This is not something apparently that extends to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but to Daniel only, the understanding of the dreams. That brings us then to chapter two. Uh, notice in chapter one, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better. Now that's probably a, a, a figure of speech, but he found them better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. That does not imply that Nebuchadnezzar lived until the first year of King Cyrus. What that says is Daniel served in the Babylonian bureaucracy the whole time of Babylonian dominance. Chapter two, there's that dream by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the dream that he, he doesn't understand. His spirit is troubled, his sleep left him. Uh, I had this dream, I can't remember what it was. I wanna know what it was and what it means. Well, tell us what it was. I don't know, you tell me. And this, they go back and forth. Nobody can do this. Uh, nobody can do this except the gods. And they don't, they're, they're not with us in human form. Well, you guys are no good to me. Uh, dispose of all of them. You know, guard, get rid of them all. So they come to Daniel, and Daniel says, Let me talk to the king. Notice in chapter 2 and verse 17, go back to chapter 1 and verse 17, Daniel has skill in understanding visions and dreams. How soon did he learn that? How soon did he know that? We don't know. But by the time this comes about in chapter 2, how old is Daniel here? Don't know. Doesn't say how much time has passed. Is he still a young man? Maybe. But regardless, at this point, he seems to know that he has the potential, potential, if God is with him, to interpret this dream. He makes the appointment, goes home, gets together with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they pray. And then the dream is revealed to Daniel. He explains it to Nebuchadnezzar. and makes the application in the revelation of the dream. Now, God give, Daniel gives credit to God for this in verse 28. He does not take credit for being able to do this. Uh, verse 28, I can, verse 27, nobody can do what you want, but God can, verse 28, and he has made known to you the future, what will be in the latter days. Uh, your dream is this. So, uh, by the way, the, the prayer of thanksgiving in verses 17 through 24, that's a, that's a good model of a prayer of thanksgiving and a good lesson on just how effective uh, genuine honest prayer can be. Well, to, well fellas, if you're going to preach, you can make a, make a good sermon out of that. Uh, but he tells the dream, he interprets it in verses 25 through 45. He gives credit to God he reveals the dream. It's this image, golden head, silver breast, brass belly, iron legs, feet of iron and clay. Uh, the image is destroyed by a stone cut without hands. Uh, the remnants of it are scattered like shaft to the winds, and the whole earth is filled with the stone and the application. The dream is explained, verses 36 through 45. We know the application here. We know what it means because Daniel tells us what it means, succeeding kingdoms leading down to the time of the coming of the Christ. Verse 44 is the key to the whole chapter, in the days of those kings. Now, the, the Jews of Jesus' day in Acts chapter 2 are looking for the kingdom. Jesus gathers huge crowds during his ministry. People are interested in listening and debating, could this be the Messiah, in large part because they have studied the book of Daniel. They know that the time has passed, that they're coming up on the time of the coming of the kingdom. And so in Acts chapter 2, 
<clears throat> you have a people who are primed to be receptive to the gospel. 3,000 obeyed on that day. Now, for what it's worth, at the same time, you probably have 30,000 that turned away. But you have a nation of people who are primed for the gospel in part because they have studied the Old Testament. Go over to Acts chapter 8 for a minute. Look at Philip and the Ethiopian nobleman. The Ethiopian is reading from Isaiah chapter 53, and Philip begins there and preaches to him Jesus from the Old Testament. I think I've said before, we really ought to be ashamed of ourselves as children of God that we don't know more about the Savior based on the Old Testament prophecies, 300 plus Old Testament prophecies of Jesus. Most of us couldn't name a dozen of them, much less a hundred or two, and give the interpretation of them. The rock in this image is Jesus the Christ. Now look down here in chapter two, verses 46 through 49. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of the whole world, basically, is blown away. He is just immensely impressed, fell upon his face, paid homage to Daniel, commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. And truly, your God is God of gods. He was very impressed that Daniel could interpret this and that he didn't claim credit for himself, but said, it's my God who's made this possible. Uh, you have been able to reveal this misery. He gave Daniel high honors, many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Basically, he made him governor of the capital province. And chief prefect, he made him the head, <laughs> the head wise guy, the head wise man over all the wise men of Babylon. And then at Daniel's request, he puts Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah over the affairs, but Daniel stays in the king's court. He's right there. Nebuchadnezzar is going to hold on to him. Now, he acknowledges Daniel's God as superior to other gods in verse 47. That does not mean he became a worshiper only of the true living God. He's simply very, very impressed that Daniel's God, even in captivity, so to speak, could do something that the idols that he worshiped had been unable to do. Now, you go over to chapter three, and you see there that he continues in idolatry and presumptuousness and arrogance. And this is the account of Daniel's friends in the fiery furnace and, and, uh, and the account of Nebuchadnezzar's immense ego. Now, he's seen God's power demonstrated in a very vivid way, but he still is a polytheist. He still is an idolater. The image in chapter three uh, seems to have been an obelisk, basically, a pinnacle-looking thing like, like the Washington Monument, about 90 feet tall, nine feet wide, 60 cubits by six, uh, cubits about 18 inches, roughly. Uh, and that may be including the pedestal on which an actual image stood. So that, that 90 feet may be the pedestal, and then there's an image at the top of it. What does it actually look like? We have no idea. We can speculate. Uh, it probably, you know, it's, it's golden, as it's described here. It probably follows the pattern of the altar that was part of the tabernacle furniture back in Exodus chapter 39. That is, it's a wooden frame overlaid with gold. The idea that this is a 90-foot tall solid gold structure, uh, that's, that's uh, even by Solomon's standard, that would be an extraordinary amount of gold. Uh, some scholars think that this, was, this image was located about six miles south of ancient Babylon, and they base that on the fact that there is a square brick pedestal uh, about 14 yards square, about roughly 45 feet square, and, and about uh, 10 feet high, that's still there. And they said that might have been the base for this image. Uh, whether or not it, th there was a, a likeness of the king incorporated into, the, into this, we have no way to know. 
Uh, it seems unlikely. He, he commanded everybody to worship it. Uh, it's dedicated. The instruction to worship is given. Uh, the presence of government officials from every level of government uh, tells us this was an important occasion uh, on the part of the emperor and kind of like the lunatic emperors of the Roman Empire, the later first century and so forth. Uh, the king commands universal worship, universal honor for his gods, no exceptions allowed. Uh, his ego is out of control. Well, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah wind up being accused uh, of not observing the king's command, which was true. But the motive of the accusation was that the, the Chaldean advisors were envious of them and scheming against them, trying to get rid of them, kind of like the same situation Daniel finds himself in in the lion's den in chapter 6. Now, a curiosity here. Why is Daniel not included in these charges? No idea. It may be that he was too high ranking for them to take aim at him. It might be that they were uh, not in a position that they could accuse him. It might be that he was not in the immediate vicinity. We don't know. In verses 13 through 18 in chapter three, the king offers them, uh, they're, they're arrested and they're tried and he offers them a, a second chance to obey his commandment. Notice in verse 15, chapter three, verse 15, uh, now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the various instruments to fall down and worship the image that I've made well and good, but if you do not, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who shall deliver you out of my hands? Look at their response. We have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. And he will. But if not, verse 18, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image that you have set up. Look at their faith, their determination. Our God is able to do this. And even if he doesn't do it, that doesn't shake our faith a little bit. How many people will you encounter? How many Christians will you encounter in your life who are willing to be faithful to God, dedicated servants, sing praises to his name as long as he does what they want? But when they don't get their way, their faith evaporates like morning dew. It's easy to be a faithful servant of God when everything is going your way. It's a whole different story when your faith is really put to the test. Well, we know how the, the uh, story ends, as it were. Uh, they're cast into the fiery furnace. Those that, that threw them in are slain by the heat. Uh, in the meantime, they're up and walking around unharmed, uh, there is a fourth image there. Now, the King James Version says, like unto the Son of God. This is uh, a bit of an interpolation in the King James translators. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar looks into this. I see four men, verse 25, walking in the midst of the fire, unhurt. The appearance of the fourth, the English standard says, is like a son of the gods, which is probably an, a more accurate translation of the, the actual wording. Nebuchadnezzar would have no, no concept of the Son of God in, in the sense of Jesus. Uh, Daniel, as far as we know, has told him nothing. The, the three friends have said nothing. They themselves know relatively nothing other than Isaiah's prophecies about the Messiah in specific terms. When he says one like unto a son of the gods, uh, 
what he's saying is there's we put three men and I see four, and the only explanation I have is this must be an embodiment of some deity. And that's the gist of what he's saying. Now he calls for them to come out, they're unhurt, don't even smell like smoke. And uh, his attitude changes uh, rather dramatically. Uh, his change of mind about his golden image in verses 28, 29, and 30 uh, has a profound this whole event is profoundly favorable to God's children now think about this for a moment if this takes place early in the years that Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah are serving who among the Jews would know about this if this happens before five between 606 and 597 you have only those who were taken as hostages, the royal family, the nobles, and so forth, who might eventually hear about this uh, in the immediate context of it. Now, if they write home to Jerusalem and tell their families about these things, certainly they would eventually, the folks in, in Judah would eventually know about this. But remember that they have been educated and put in positions of authority. So this probably takes place some years down the road after 597, perhaps Ezekiel and, and the, the upper class uh, exiles are already settled in Babylon, they would hear about these events. They would see some of these things. If it takes place after 586, after the destruction of Jerusalem, then you've got basically the whole nation of Judah in captivity and exile in some, some form in Babylon. And these events could not go unnoticed by God's people. Come down to verse 29. And the thing that stands out to Nebuchadnezzar is, I've never seen any other God do anything like this. There is no other God who's able to rescue or deliver in this way. Uh, so, he promotes these guys in spite of their having defied him. His attitude has changed dramatically. Well, chapter four, uh, the greatest of human powers is utterly helpless compared to God. And you have the king's edict, the king's order about uh, all of the things that, that, Neb that, that uh, Daniel's God has done for him. He has another dream. Uh, this is the dream of the mighty tree, and Daniel has to interpret this. Notice verse 19 in chapter 4. Now, this is where Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar, uh, things are going to be tough for you. you you've, you've messed up, and God is going to make you pay for it. But at verse 19, Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while. His thoughts alarmed him. Now, when God has, has given him the understanding of, of what's coming, uh, he, he's worried, not about God and not about what's coming, but about how the king may take this. And so the king says, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. And Daniel is <laughs> Daniel's diplomatic here. My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. In other words, I, 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 hope that, I hope that I'm wrong and this doesn't apply to you, but to the people that hate you. But in the meantime, here's the, here's the interpretation of the dream. And the application is you need to understand who's really in charge here. And it ain't you. Verses 24 and 25. Now, the balance of the chapter records the interim period, about seven years that Nebuchadnezzar is out of his mind. And his reason returns at the end of seven times, whether that's three and a half years or seven years. Scholars argue back and forth about that. But his kingdom is returned to him when he realizes that he's only king because God allowed him to be. Well, as we said, chapter five, uh, the handwriting on the wall, chapter six, Daniel in the lion's den. You're, you're familiar with these 
accounts and these events, and you can certainly go back and review them for yourself. Chapter seven is Daniel's dream. The, the visions in chapter seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 are not the king's, they're Daniel's visions. Uh, the four beasts, the ancient of days, the son of man in chapter seven, uh, visions of the future, visions of things yet to come. Now, come down in chapter seven to verses 25 and 26. King Darius wrote to all the people's nations, languages, peace, I make a decree in all my royal dominion. Now this, again, this is late in Daniel's life. Darius is now the ruler. The Babylonians have been vanquished. I make a decree that in all my dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the end. Now, uh, as, we, as we go through this, uh, Daniel prospers in the reign of Darius and Cyrus the Persian. Uh, in chapter seven, I, I'm sorry, I, that was chapter six I was reading. That didn't sound right. Chapter seven, verse 26, the court shall sit in judgment. His dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. The application of the vision here, Daniel's understanding, uh, the power of the beast that's portrayed here will be broken, his realm destroyed. And the point is this is in contrast to the power and the longevity of the saint's kingdom. Chapter eight brings us to the ram and the he goat and the desecrating horn. This is the Medo-Persians confronting the Alexander the Great and then those who follow him. Uh, Antiochus, the days of the Maccabees in 175 BC, moving rapidly forward in history. And I see that our time is up. And so we'll talk about the last couple of chapters of Daniel next week. And maybe next week we'll get caught up with our schedule. Questions, comments. Thank you for your patience in listening as I've rambled. Well, if that be the case, then good night, everybody. Thank you for being here.